Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Sanjida Alam. I'm one of the heritage officers here at the archive working on programming and engagement. Um, welcome to our talk this evening um, on artists on the Lincoln Estate with William Rayburn. This event is part of our program for our current exhibition, Living in Fear of Quicksand by Maria Amadou. Um, for all of those who are new to us, um, Tower Hamlet's local history library and archive um, helps preserve the library, uh, helps preserve library and archival material on the history of the borough. We help make these materials available to the public for research. Our collections are extensive and include library material, which is published material and archival material, generally unique records. Um, in addition to that, we also have paintings and museum objects, um, which we've just accumulated throughout time um, as we don't tend to actively collect um, objects and paintings. Um, and we cover all sorts of topics from housing, migration, anti-racism, working class history, um, prominent figures in the borough. Um, so please go to our website for more details if you're interested in sort of local history uh, and, and archive. Um, as mentioned, this event is part of a wider program of events taking place as part of the current exhibition. Um, the exhibition is in partnership with us and uh, Nunnery Gallery, uh, who are based at Bow Arts. The exhibition consists of new work produced by Maria Amadou and existing archive material. Um, and it takes place across two venues, um, us here at the archive and also at the Nunnery. Um, the exhibition explores the fragmentary nature of memory in relation to a, fra in relation to a fragile experience of home. Um, at the archive here, the focus is placed on the architectural and social history of the Lincoln Estate in Tower Hamlets and the artist's brief place within it during the uh, 70s. So do come and see the show. Um, it ends on the 20th of May. Um, with some of those key areas and themes in mind, today we're going to explore how local artists mobilized and collaborated in the Lincoln Estate during the 70s. Um, but before we start the evening, uh, Genova, would you mind having a presentation up? Um, yes, yeah, sure, I'll share my screen now. What we're going to do is have a short uh, presentation by Genova, who is also um, a, her a heritage officer um, covering learning part and participation, both of us we job share. Um, so there'll be a short presentation on sort of the history of the Lincoln Estate. And then um, we go to our guest speaker today, William Urban. And then at the end, we'll have a Q&A. So I hope everybody can see the full screen. Let me know in the chat if there are any technical issues in terms of viewing that you have. Otherwise, Genova, I'm handing it all to you. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, everybody. I'm Genova. Um, as Sanjita said, one of the learning and participation officers here. I hope you can all hear me okay. I'm going to just give a very short uh, timeline history with some images of maps and some of our collections. Um, very short, I'm not going to take up too much of your time before I hand over to our guest speaker. So, oh. for some reason, first techie issue, the first page is not turning. Oh. Here we are. So I hope everyone can see that. So here we have, um, you can also zoom in on your screen as well if you want to go a bit closer to the image. So here we have a map of, uh, can everyone see my cursor? There we go. Uh, we have a map of the area that will become the Lincoln Estate. Uh, this is a map of, from 1864 and it shows here, see my cursor we've got Blackthorn Street on the right hand side where those pink squares are and we've also got Fern Street Blackthorn Street uh, was laid in 1863 over what was uh, market gardens and market gardens um, went into decline during the industri industrial period uh, to make way for housing for the growing population 
So here we have Blackthorn Street here and we have Fern Street here. I don't want to go too fast just in case you want to have a look at the map a little bit more. Uh, here we have a Booth poverty map from 1899 and this shows the the same area we have we have Tidy Street here we've got Fern Street and Blackthorn Street up here and the Booth poverty maps uh, would show uh, cover colour coded areas streets in colour coded areas of the level of um, poverty so the darker the area really just kind of reveals how poor the area was so you can see that uh bow common here is dark blue so very poor and uh ca casual want so the demographic of this area here was um pretty poor and destitute um oh, there you are i hope you can all see that image of the boundary estate so a little bit about uh, the london county council so the london county council was an organization that was that kind of headed slum clearance in the East End. And they built um, the very first council or social housing estate between 1893 and 1900. I mean, it opened in 1900. And you see here um, the boundary estate just on the border of Bethnal Green, Shoreditch. Uh, the bandstand in the middle was called Arnold Circus. <clears throat> and that was constructed in about 1910. But um, yes, the, the estate opened in 1900 and you can see the blocks here. So these are kind of typical of the housing that um, the London County Council or LCC um, built at this time. They were like four to five stories high, um, kind of five stories of the highest that they would go because they didn't have lifts at the time. So yeah, that's the boundary estate. And during the interwar years, so um, after World War One and between World War One and World War Two, the LCC kind of took control of building social housing, um, and many estates like this popped up throughout the East End. Slides not changing. So back to the area that will become the Lincoln Estate. So on the left side, we have a bomb damage map. And if you can see my cursor here. So here we have Blackthorn Street and Whitethorn Street. We have Tidy Street here. And you can see the area, um, the areas that are darker are the areas that were um, kind of destroyed, uh, damaged, badly damaged or destroyed during the Blitz. So the darker the area, uh, the worst the damage so you can see here like you have purple and you have black um areas so uh the next map we have on the right side is an os map from 1946 so just after world war ii and you have these little boxes i don't know if you can see my cursor's not there it is so these little squares here that look different to the terrace houses so this is where the the kind of the brunt of the bomb damage was and these are prefabricated houses and prefabricated houses were like temporary pop-up accommodation um for people that had lost their homes during the blitz and yeah you can see quite a few of them on the maps throughout um the east end here you've got these little squares and i'll show you a picture of the prefab house as they were known so this uh, these, these are some prefab houses in um poplar and um, people that lived in prefab houses at the time said that they were actually quite modern living spaces and they had fitted kitchens, open plan. Um, and prefabricated houses had a lifespan of about 10 years, but a lot of these houses uh, lasted a bit longer. Um, a, lot of them, a lot of people were living in them for a lot longer than 10 years. So um, in 1953, uh, the LCC acquired the land um that would become the lincoln estate and they submitted uh, proposals for two um high rises um and in 1956 um they had uh got clearance to build two 19-story blocks and um, that would later become sleaford house and gayton house and 
this was um, opposed by the popular metropolitan Metropolitan Borough Council, uh, the governing body at the time before the creation of uh, the London Borough of Tower Hamlets. And uh, they kind of opposed the idea of having two high rises uh, in the borough, um, in the area. So um, this is kind of a quote from the um, popular Metropolitan Borough. They said, we are of the opinion that generally people in this borough do not favour this type of development and are not very happy in these tall buildings where they find the living conditions, particularly on the upper floors, far from satisfactory. Um, however, the LCC had clearance to build the two high rises. So um, construction was underway in 1957 and um, the, the height of the blocks meant that uh, they had to install lifts and the lifts actually cost 20% of the overall cost of um, building these blocks so it was very costly um but yes um they went ahead with the, the construction plans and the Lincoln Estate opened in 1962 so here's an image here of um the low level so there was masonettes as well so they weren't just the two 19-story uh, blocks they also had uh, masonettes and 40 percent of the homes had a private garden um, and more on the ground floor. So there was a mixture of low level and high rise uh, and the high rises. Here's an image of um, Sleaford House when the estate opened in uh, 1962. Uh, this image is from uh, the London Metropolitan Archives. So tenants started moving into um, Sleaford House between 62 and 64. And this is an image of the Lincoln Estate in uh, 1989. Uh, the London Borough of Tower, Ham um, London Borough of Tower Hamlets took over ownership of uh, the estate from the GLC, which took over from the LCC um, after 1986. Um, as uh, Tower Hamlets was a borough council, they kind of had restrictions in getting um, external funding and um, being able to and raise the funds to maintain uh, properties and um, estates. So there was a lot of um, estates, uh, including the Lincoln estate, that fell into disrepair. And in 1997, um, with a vote from 70% of residents, a housing association, Poplar Harker, took over the Lincoln estate um, because they were able to get external funding, private funding, to kind of maintain and revamp block as you can see in this image here uh, the block has had some recladding I think it's twice now um, two bouts of recladding to kind of uh, um, modernize the block even though there's quite a lot of a uh, debate about if it looks better or not but yes um, that's that's it for me that's my short history of the Lincoln estate um, I don't know if you want to uh, jump in the Sanjeeda yeah, thank next you um, no thank worries you, um, so, our archivist, Andrew Lewis, if I can bring Andy in here, um, did some of the research uh, for the exhibition to uh, the archival aspect of it. So I don't know, Andy, if you wanted to add anything extra? Not really. I thought uh, Jan did a really uh, excellent job of compressing what is a complicated story into uh, you know, a short time frame. Um, just to explain the reason I didn't give the talk, having done the research, um, Genova very kindly actually stepped in uh, to do it for me, is because I only work part time. I, don't, I didn't really have the time to put together anything um, uh, to present tonight, but I did want to come along to add a bit of support to the event and also to chip in with any, any thoughts I might have. The one thing... Um, which emerged from the research for me, and I will be very quick here, I'm not going to take up too much of your time because obviously we want William to talk. Um, but the, the main theme which emerged from the research that I uh, carried out for Maria was of the tensions between um, the LCC and um, the local authority, Poplar. I mean, it was very evident and Genova um, brought up a document there uh, or a quote from a document which made it very clear that there were tensions between these two authorities. And I think that's a kind of perennial theme of uh, uh, the history of housing in 
probably London and other um, metropolitan areas as well, that you have different layers of um, authority and power, and they often clash. And in terms of the research, the key thing, if anybody's interested in ever doing any uh, research into housing, the key thing is to determine who's got the power um, with regards to uh, housing developments, and then follow the document trail in that direction. That's where you'll find most information. That's all really that I, I would add in terms of uh, uh, the research sort of methodology, which I, I, I used to help Maria out in putting this thing together. Great, thank you. Um, thank you. I guess as we move on, we'll get to uh, see perhaps some of the complications and how that impacts people living on the estate. And uh, yeah, uh, so William, <laughs> let me, if I could. Oh, let me stop sharing on my screen. Mm -hmm. If you could unmute yourself, and I will bring your presentation up. Um, so, welcome, William, and thank you so much for uh, doing this talk for us. Um, it'll be really nice to see. We are all um, at the archive here. Our research and involvement in local history can be quite dry mechanical and technical sometimes. So um, we bring to you the human aspect <laughs> uh, to living in the borough. Um, let me just, I hope everybody can. Okay, there we go. William, I hand it all over to you now, if you could um, introduce yourself as well. <laughs> Yes, hi. Uh, I'm William Raven, and I've I moved onto the Lincoln Estate in 1976. <clears throat> and then it was a neighbourhood that had suffered from long-term neglect, as uh, Jennifer and Andrew made clear. Um, there was a mix of 1960s council flats and Victorian terraced houses mm -hmm. on the four roads, and I'm mainly going to be talking about the um, the four roads. So if we could have the second slide, it's a bit clearer, I think. That's it. It's a bit more high contrast and a bit closer up. So um, this is uh, an estate si a sign um, on where you can probably just see the uh, the red arrow down at the bottom left hand corner of the map. So that locates it on Knapp Road where that sign is. And I'm mostly going to be talking about Fairfoot Road that runs up at the top, you can see, um, Spamby Road, Knapp Road, and Swayton Road. <coughs> so um, <coughs> those are the four roads. Uh, but first of all, I'm going to do a brief history with a little bit of over overlap, overlap, not much, with what uh, Jennifer had, had to say, which I found extremely interesting. Um, the whole local area, uh, in, in, until the 1860s, the whole local area was market gardens producing food for London. The rich alluvial soils were full of nutrients, which still be benefit gardens on the estate today. And I'm glad you mentioned the Charles Booth poverty map, Geneva, because I just wanted to say that uh, in the map of 1889, the Charles Booth map, the population is described as a mix of fairly comfortable and some poor. That's on those specific four roads. Um, and the 1871 census reveals residents on Fairfoot Road had a variety of occupations, dressmakers, tailors, sail makers, ship chandlers, coopers, coppersmiths, accountants, and piano makers, often with three families living in one house. The houses had suffered bomb damage, again, as Jennifer pointed out, during the war, um, 
with most of the houses between Spanby Road and the gas works destroyed. What was left were run down with outdoor toilets and poor amenities, so that families living on the four roads welcomed the opportunity to relocate to the eastern suburbs of London and Essex. As families moved out from these houses, the council moved in, ripping out the windows, toilets and plumbing, then boarding up, up the houses with sheets of corrugated iron uh, they were kind of colloquially called council curtains when I moved in. Council curtains were the sheets of corrugated iron that were boarded up over the windows. And this was to discourage squatters from taking the houses over. Um, it was a short term me measure because uh, all the houses on the four roads were due for demolition in order to build a large new primary school on the site. It was uneconomic for housing associations to manage them, since the cost of temporary repair would be too expensive. Lincoln Estate was typical of large parts of East London, where in the 1970s, there were whole streets of boarded up houses awaiting redevelopment. But this provided an opportunity for Acme Housing Association to take over these properties and to sublet them to artists for use of studios and accommodation. Um, so if you can have the next slide, please, Sanjita. That's it. So uh, Acne Housing Association was formed in 1972 by Jonathan Harvey, who's standing on the right in that photo, and David Panton, standing on the left, with the intention of managing short-term housing owned by both by the GLC and by the local council and subletting those houses uh, to artists pending demolition and redevelopment. Acme's first properties were, were those two shops, that's one of them on Devons Road, 105 and 109. Acme quickly gained a good reputation for returning houses back to the councils when the short-term licenses expired, which ensured that the councils trusted Acme and, and, and sent a steady supply of semi-derelict housing their way. But that source of housing dried up during London's property boom during the early 1990s. On the Lincoln Estate, most of the Victorian houses were taken over by Acme and occupied by artists. So by the end of the 1970s, there was a thriving artistic community developing here. Acme organized a weekly food co-op, mostly selling vegetables, and some Acme artists taught, taught in local schools. Acme helped many young artists like me to have the opportunity to live in cheap, short-term accommodation. We all had to learn basic building skills to make the houses habitable. And when the work was too much for one person, we helped each other out to keep a roof over our heads. Artists worked with traditional forms of painting and sculpture, as well as newer disciplines, such as dance, performance, film, and video. I'm going to show now um, three short extracts from the film 7282, which I made in 2014 where you will hear three artists talking about what it was like moving into these houses. The second artist speaking, Jock McFadden, occupied a house on Turner's Road, just off St Paul's Way. But even though it was a short way off from the Lincoln Estate, Jock's story is typical of artists living on the four roads on the Lincoln Estate. So if we could run the film extract, please, with the sound nice and fairly loud. 105 Devons Road. So you walked in from the street into what effectively was my studio. So it was actually a fantastic space, big and good. It was just one long continuous thing of boarded up houses, just corrugated iron actually, endless, endless. You could walk for miles and it was just corrugated iron and very kind of run down. Of course, the whole of the old residents, they were keeping hens, chickens, ducks, 
you know, vegetable gardens. So behind the terraces, there was a corner of Devon's Road and Swayton Road, I think. I remember one morning saying, I can hear cows mooing. There were some cows being kept in there. Yeah, extraordinary. There's lots of pictures of um, people where they run their gardens together. And I think that aspect was not introducing something. It was really being taken up from what was there before and our vegetable curve. It was, yeah, hands in the soil. And, you know, it was very much doing things yourself. And people were extremely friendly. I have described to you, William, my Acme house was the worst Acme house on the books. There was no pride of ownership. The basement was pretty disgusting. It had damp. It had Buddleia growing through the walls. The house next door was propped up with huge wooden beams, and I had the whole place to myself. I had a ramp that went up the steps, so on the ground floor I kept my motorcycle collection, and that's where I painted as well. I made sculpture downstairs in the basement and in the garden. Wouldn't invest in central heating. So the double glazing was sheets of polythene over the windows and leaving the gas oven open, full blast. It was make-do and makeshift. It didn't leak. It was spacious. It was a grand Victorian terraced house. I was very lucky to have it. It was cheap, but it was a wreck. And it wasn't until the later 1980s that with the international enthusiasm for figurative painting at the time. By that time, I had a dealer and I was selling paintings and was able to subsequently buy another house. But the Acme house carried on as my studio. It was unfit for human habitation by any reasonable interpretation. Like a lot of artists, I had the habit of not paying a bill until it was read. So I'm afraid I'm hanging on for as long as I can. I ended up in Berlin for a year and then came back, got an Acme house. And I guess my awareness of Acme actually started at that kind of time in 1973 to four. It was in Swayton Road and um, I had sort of ambitions for the house. It was pretty damp and it had valley guttering, which turned out to be you know, kind of like the kiss of death for me. And eventually the roof collapsed slightly and a load of water came in. But I was there for maybe four or five years. And it was an extraordinary time. You know, there was so much corrugated iron about, you know, like everything was tinned up. And then when there were storms, you could hear the rattling and the bits of tin flying about, you know, when it was really heavy going. So it had it also its kind of danger in a funny way. And it was sort of half abandoned, absolutely, right up my street. I really liked it. It wasn't what you might call a tight community, but there were references, you know, like Kerry Trengove lived on the same road and so on. So it had a very strong sense of being temporary, you know. So one was there lightly, not, not heavily. And this is the period in which I began to make these works at Acme. Good. Thank you. So if we could go back to the presentation, please. Yep. yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the artist Paul Burwell lived on Knapp Road and he performed as a drummer and staged large scale pyrotechnic performances with artists Anne Bean and Richard Wilson. They formed the collective Bo Gamelan that performed in London and all over the world. Paul Burwell had been a close friend of mine since the early 70s. And as near neighbors on the estate, we spent a lot of time together. That's Paul. Um, Paul worked on two of my films in the 90s, the first of which was Beating the Bridges. That's a still from that where Paul played his drum kit on a boat as it drifted down under all the bridges through central London from Lambeth to Dartford. We filmed all the London bridges before six o'clock in the morning when the traffic was quiet. So the film picks up the echoes and reverberations of the drums as, as we passed under each bridge. Paul then worked on my film Fire Station that was commissioned by Acme Studios 
to celebrate the opening of the old fire station in Gillander Street um, after it had been converted to work lift studios for artists. Uh, I think the next slide, if we could go to that. Yes, that, that is the old fire station uh, on Gillander Street um, before it was uh, converted to artist studios. <clears throat> Part of, uh, part of the film, Fire Station film, recounts the role of the fire, st the, the fire station played during the Blitz in the Second World War. Two women who served in the auxiliary fire service at the fire station described their experiences during the war. Paul produced percussion and a number of pyrotechnic effects to make it look as though the fire station had been set ablaze, having been hit by a firebomb. So if we could have the next slides, please. That one. That was um, a fire event that Paul Burwell created on the inside staircase inside the fire station. And the next slide. And that was uh, making it look as though the whole of the back of the building was on fire. In fact, it was very safe. It, look, it looks it looks horrific, I know, but um, uh, it, it's all done using simple pyrotechnic effects. And uh, uh, Paul had buckets of water to hand and fire extinguishers, but uh, it, 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 was, it, it wasn't that bad. So um, can we have the next slide, please? This is Paul and faintly you can see Kirsten Reynolds in the background. They're playing fire drums in the big garage of the fire station. Uh, and the next slide. Lovely. And that's the fire station after it had been converted to artist studios and more or less how it looks now. And the next slide, please. Right, uh, Ray Walker was an Acme artist who made public art in the form of large murals on the streets of Tower Hamlets and Hackney. This, this is the mural painted on a wall on Bow Common Lane, where the road used to run through Mile End Park, past Burdett Road. Ray Walker worked with Mike Jones and the Art Workers Co-op to produce the mural that celebrates the 600 year anniversary of the Peasants' Revolt, led by Watt Tyler in 1381. That's this mural here. Sadly, it got demolished when the uh, Mile End Park was extended uh, just before 2000. And the next slide, please. Right. Uh, this is the mural on the side of St. George's Town Hall on Cable Street that commemorates the 1936 Battle of Cable Street, in which an organized group of local res resistance stopped Oswald Mott Mosley and his fascist black shirts from marching through the Jewish East End. The mural was the work of several artists, including Ray Walker. And the next slide is slightly better. That one is a close, closer up, you can see it more clearly. And the next slide is, is, is the right-hand section of the mural. <clears throat> Having lived in London since, 1960, since 1967, I've grown up to love the city, despite the noise, grime and dirt in the city. That affection has been tempered somewhat since Brexit by the loss of freedoms consistent with being part of the European Union. Brexit is making it much more difficult for artists, musicians and writers to work in Europe. London, of course, is made up of a number of different communities, each with its own particular feelings and idiosyncrasies. I started my London life in Tufnell Park, moved to Kentish Town, Islington, then for a couple of months to Pimlico, which I really enjoyed, then to Clapham North, which I found very interesting, and on to Hackney, but I never felt much affinity for Hackney. 
I've lived on the Lincoln estate in Tower Hamlets, as I said, since 1976. It may not be visually exciting, except for the cemetery park, which is truly amazing. But I love the Lincoln estate for its rich and diverse community. This area in and around the East End has undergone massive demographic and social change, mainly as a consequence of the Docklands Regeneration Programme in the 1980s and 90s. The single biggest architectural icon resulting from this inner city redevelopment is the Canary Wharf Tower, which was the centerpiece of the Tory government's plan to relocate the financial centre of the City of London to the Isle of Dogs. At 235 metres tall, the Canary Wharf Tower was the tallest building in the UK by the time it was completed in 1991. This was just one year after the end of Margaret Thatcher's prime ministerial reign that had overseen a, a decade of impoverishment, stagflation and destruction of trade union power. So it's understandable that the tower became known, excuse the expression, as Thatcher's Dick by people living under its shadow in East London, many of whom would have remembered the Docker strikes led, led by Jack Dash in the 1960s and the unilateral declaration of independence of the Isle of Dogs proposed by local Labour councillor Ted Johns in March 1970. I shall finish by showing Sundar, there was a one minute film commission for BBC Two and the Arts Council. Sundar was filmed over the course of 28 days in January, 1992. The rule I set myself was that I could only film on cloudless days. And I was fortunate that there was little cloud cover during that month. All the positions from which I filmed were within a mile radius of Canary Wharf Tower and the purpose was to see whether I could construct a coherent portrait of the area from 72 separate views of the Canary Wharf Tower, filmed within the 60 seconds of the film's duration. The tower always appears mid-frame, but the various foreground spaces where communities lived under its oppressive shadow were of equal interest to me. So within the film's short length, there's a mapping of the local social geography the tower casts its shadow over great swathes of East London, and I intended that the film should show the tower to be like the pointer of a sundial, hence the film's title. So if we could try and show sundial now, please, with sound, ideally.